Lager? Lager? Ah, ja, ja. Ah, ja. Thank you so much. I'm gonna get a ride to plot five. It's a huge cemetery, yeah, right? It's very, very big. It's, a, it's about like 204 acres, I think. So, are you ready to go? Now? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Hi, this is Anna from Death Travels. I travel the world and make videos about different funeral and mourning customs and I visit interesting resting places. So if you're interested in the subject of death, welcome to my channel, Death Travels. Today I want you to join me uh, in a search for the grave of once a very powerful and very wealthy Canadian man who survived the Titanic disaster by jumping into one of the lifeboats that were reserved only for women and children. Yes, and if you remember Titanic, the movie with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, there was a villain character that screamed, I have a child! I have a child! Get out of there! Please, I have a child! Please, I'm all she has in the world. His story kind of really cro closely resembles the story of Major Arthur Godfrey uh, Pugin, I hope I pronounced it right, um, who for the rest of his life had to live with the labor of a coward. So today I'm at Mount Pleasant Cemetery where he's buried and I'll try to find his grave and let's learn a little bit more about his tragic and sad and fascinating story. Uh, join me on this adventure. Thank you so much. I'm going to get a ride to plot five. Yay. Wow. Okay. This is a real treat for me. Okay. Thank you, sir. My goodness. It's a huge cemetery, yeah, it's right? It's very, very big. It's, a, it's about like 204 acres, I think. Are you serious? Yeah. So it goes all the way from Bay, Bayview crosses over Mount Pleasant and goes all the way to Young Street. Oh, wow. And how old is it? I don't know how old it is, but like there's from the 1800s. You got to think there's people buried here from the 1800s, like the late 1800s. So like, wow. uh, I don't know exactly like oh, the date lines and stuff, but. Oh my goodness, I was so lucky to get the ride. The guy was super um, open and friendly and uh, I think the ride was like at least almost like 10 minutes. So yeah, yeah, it would have been a very long walk. Um, and he dropped me off in a section that is really old, looks really, really old. Let's look at it. And I'm still confused as to where to find Mr. Pugin's grave. I have a photo though, so I'll try to locate it. So as we are trying to locate Mr. Pugin's grave, which is um, plot number five, I have no idea, there's no map here. Um, Let's learn a little bit about him. So he was born in 1859 in Montreal, Canada. And so it was like 164 years ago very long time ago. Um, he came from a very wealthy family, very well established, but he was also a great businessman. So he quickly, you know, um, kind of became even more wealthy. And at the age of 34, he married Margaret Thompson and started a family. What you should know about him is that he was actually a very seasoned sailor, and I think that the word is uh, commander. So he was um, a vice commander at the uh, Royal Yacht Club in Toronto. Um, so he knew how to sail. He was not, no stranger to water and water sports. Uh, and I think that is one of the very important pieces to that story. My goodness, I'm so close yet so far away. No idea where to look for um, his gravestone. And everything looks the same, <laughs> more or less. And it's really confusing. I feel like I've been 
running around for for quite a bit but it has to be there has to be a better way to do it a few moments later <laughs> Woo! wow we're getting to plot v to see where mr pugin is located It's really insane. It's such a huge cemetery. Pardon me? Ah, uh, yeah, I am. I am. V, yeah, we made it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. And off he goes, and yeah, we are at Plot V. Let's try to look for Mrs. Mr. Pugin's Pugin uh, grave, tombstone grave. Pugin was often abroad for business and crossing on Titanic was supposed to be his 40th transatlantic voyage. So when he set his foot on Titanic in 1912, um, that wasn't something extraordinary. He was a first class passenger, occupied a suite C-104 and he paid 30 pounds for his ticket, which uh, accounts for, I think, 3,500 pounds today. And just to give you a perspective, a working man on 100 pounds a year could easily uh, raise his family without any particular obstacles. So compare 30 pounds versus 100 pounds per year, that's a big, big, big difference. Interestingly, Pugin didn't have many misgivings about the sailing on the Titanic except for the captain, Captain Smith. So allegedly when he found out that Smith was the captain, um, he said, surely not that man. He just simply thought that Smith was too old for the job and he also knew his checkered um, career and mishaps that happened in the past. He didn't really have much choice, so he went with it. But as we know today, he was 100% right. On the night Titanic sank, Mr. Pugin sat down to dinner in the first class dining room with Harry Molson of the Montreal Brewery Dynasty. If you never tried Molson Court, you should definitely do that. It's a very famous Canadian beer. And later that night, he learned from a steward that Titanic struck the iceberg, but he never believed that Titanic can sink. Well, sounds familiar, right? So he grabbed only three oranges from his cabin, his lucky pearl pin, and he left behind pretty much everything else, which was around $200,000 in stock and bonds, jewelry, all gifts for his family, pretty much everything else. And he allegedly believed that he's going to come back and pick it up later because, again, did not think that the Titanic is going to sink. According to Mr. Pugin, this is what happened on the night the Titanic sank. When Pugin arrived at the boat deck, the covers had already been removed from the lifeboats and the ropes were ready to lower them into the sea. Pugin noticed, however, that there weren't many sailors around the lifeboats. And as the lifeboat number six was being lowered, he noticed it didn't have enough people. The quartermaster, who was already in the boat, called for help and Pugin, who identified himself as a yachtman, offered to join. At this point, however, the lifeboat was already 25 feet below the deck Pugin was on. So Captain Smith, who happened to be standing nearby, 
suggested Pugin go down one flight of stairs and break a window on the promenade deck to get into the lifeboat. But the second officer replied that if Pugin indeed was a, as good a sailor as he claimed to be, he could slip down the ropes uh, to get into the boat. So Pugin took up the challenge, of course, grabbed a rope and climbed down 25 feet into the boat. And according to him, he only realized the Titanic was sinking when he saw it from the lifeboat. And they rowed away to avoid being pulled down when the ship sank. That way, Pugin ended up being the only male passenger allowed in that lifeboat on the port side and would spend the rest of his days trying to explain why and how this happened. His survival led to his undoing, branded a coward back in the polite Toronto society for not being gentleman enough to go down with the ship. The story, as described by Mr. Pugin, was depicted in a 1958 docudrama titled A Night to Remember. The film portrayed a stiff upper lip British officers as gallant heroes saving noble aristocrats. A true-to-life scene shows yachtman Major Arthur Pugin climbing down ropes to help men lifeboat number six. Take a look. Hey, son! We only got one sailor in this boat! Are there any spare hands here? I'll go, if you like. Are you a sailor? I'm a yachtsman. If you're seaman enough to nip down that lifeline, you can go. Hello! Sir! Let's have that line! Right. Good luck. To avoid allegations of being a coward, a while on a rescue ship Carpathia, he asked an officer on that ship to sign a letter that him, Pugin, uh, was ordered by an officer uh, on the Titanic to get into the lifeboat. lifeboat. 2,000 years later. Mr. Pugin, where are you? I'm trying to find you. You're hiding from me. I have no clue. Oh my God, I found it. I found it. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, I found it. Look at it. It's a very, very um, small compared to anything else here. All those pink tombstones. And Lieutenant Arthur Gottfried Pugin. 1859-1929 has beloved wife Margaret Thompson that we mentioned she died um, um, after he did well we did it oh, I'm so proud that we were able to do it it's very un insignificant um, when I look at it but it's quite a history behind that gravestone and so after Mr. Pugin came back to Canada, he was portrayed by uh, media. Tabloids were just, you know, uh, uh, starting to appear in Canada. He was portrayed as a villain. You could only have villains and heroes in this case, and he was portrayed as a villain. Uh, they said, for example, that it, you know, he said he was a sailor to just get off the Titanic. If there had been a fire, he would have told everyone he was a fireman. His family struggled with um, a lot of these accusations for years, and even his grand grandchildren right now um, sort of, you know, have that label still attached to his name and, and try to really, um, you know, fight with it and, 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 and save his good name. But there he is, Mr. Pugin, Lieutenant Pugin. So that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for watching um, and you know, learning with me about Mr. Pugin's um, story. Um, if you like the video, please slide a like on it and leave me a comment in the comment section. I wonder if you think he was a villain, uh, do you think he was a coward, or do you believe that he genuinely just wanted to help um, with, um, with the light boats? Um, and yeah, uh, till next time, thank you so much.